Well, welcome to Underground. Glad you guys are here. I hope uh, two of y'all are excited. That's cool. That's a, a good percentage tonight. All right. That was all fake, but that's okay. Uh, my name's Chad. I'm the director here. Uh, unless you don't like it, then I don't know you, nor do you know me. Just kidding. Hey, if you have a, um, if you have a smartphone, anything that has access to the internet, I'm going to put this up. Uh, if you want to follow along tonight um, through version, you can type this link in on your browser on your phone. And it'll give you all the notes and all the passages we're going to go through tonight. So if you're a phone person and you don't have your Bible, uh, feel free to use that. There's some polls and questions and kind of fun stuff you can do along the way. But if you text while I talk, I will steal your phone. Um, okay, real quickly, who remembers the very first job you ever had? Just raise your hand. You remember your very first job. Okay, I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to tell them what your very first job was. Quickly, go. Two seconds, go. Now turn to the other side and tell them. Turn behind you, tell them. Y'all up there too? Not getting out of it? All right, in the back, y'all too. First jobs, get it out. All right, that's good. All right. My first job, you ready for this? Drum roll, not really. Was at Sonic. How many Sonic fans in the house? That's what I'm talking about. Yes, uh, so I started, my first job was at Sonic. I started there when I was 16, uh, I was 17, I apologize. Basically, the rule was if I was gonna, uh, if I was gonna drive, I had to have a job, I had to pay for my own insurance, I pay for my own cell phone. Some of y'all have been there, do that now, understand. And uh, so I worked at Sonic, and man, it was some hard work, it was fun work, it was hard work. It wasn't, yeah, it's good. It wasn't the ideal, like, greatest job in the world, but it really wasn't that bad. I got to eat whatever I wanted for free. I don't think they do that anymore, probably because of me, but that's another point. But I started at Sonic, and I will never forget when I got my first paycheck. How many of y'all remember that? Even if it's $10, right? It was so good. It's yours. Like, you own that. You could do whatever you want with it. And I remember I got my first check, and you know what I did with it? God, no, I got signed up for you. That's good. It's good, though. I actually, uh, believe it or not, it was the one of maybe three times in my life, and I'm not knocking it. I just, it's not for me. But I went, actually, to Abercrombie and Fitch, and I bought my first shirt by myself. Now, I didn't wear Abercrombie. My family, we couldn't afford that. That wasn't even an option, even on the clearance rack. But, um, but I knew that, like, I had this check. This was mine. I worked hard for this. I earned this, and I was going to go spend it. So I took all $150, and I spent, like, $59.99 of it plus tax on this polo. Now, looking back, we all can say the same thing that I'm thinking as I present this. You're like, that was stupid, right? What a waste of money. Who spends $60 on a polo? But at that time, it was something that I wanted, something that I felt like I had earned. I had worked hard, and I wanted to use that money. Tonight, where we're going is we're going to be talking about working and wealth, working and wealth, and the reality is they go hand in hand, all right? Uh, There's a problem in the church today here in America, and the problem is this. There are a good portion of people that believe the correct way to live your life is to be Rich. If you have a lot of money, you are considered blessed because God has been faithful to you. And so therefore, because you've been faithful to him, he blesses you with money. We call it the prosperity gospel. The closer I draw to God, the more money he gives me because the more faithful I've been. But then you have this other extreme that says... That's not it. It's the opposite. We should sell everything that we have. We should own nothing, and we should just trust the Lord to provide everything. And the reality is both of those are swinging way too far on one side over the other. There is nothing good about saying, I'm going to raise my family for y'all one day, my five kids, after I sell everything and we just make it happen. That's not smart. But that's also this thought that if I just, if I keep getting money, then that means God blesses me. And if I don't have money, that means he doesn't love me. That's not true at all. We have these extremes and these, it's causing some problems in the churches because we're arguing over the stupid stuff when the reality of scripture is really clear. It's really clear what we're to do. So that's where we're going tonight. And I know some of you are going, man, you're going to start talking about money and work. I don't have any money. I got a dollar, maybe to my name, maybe 10 if I want to be honest, right? Here's the point. All of us need to understand this, okay? 
God makes it really clear in Scripture, if we're faithful with the little, he'll be faithful to give us more, right? And that doesn't always mean money. Get that through your head. But the reality is if we're faithful with a little, he will then be able to trust us with more. So regardless of where we're at, money-wise, whether you have your first job and you're making six figures or you got your first job and you're making six dollars, the reality is this is going to hit home with all of us tonight. Okay, so that's where we're going. If you have a Bible, you can open. We're going to be flying around tonight. That's why I kind of suggest if you have a phone, you follow along there. But the scriptures will be on the screen, and if you are super fast, you can flip along. Um, We've been working through the series Proverbs, Uncommon Sense, all right? And we are on the second to last one. Next week, we will close it all down. We have one big old conclusion. We're going to wrap it all up, and then we're going to move into a new series on spiritual gifts. It's going to be fantastic. Um, But the writer of most of Proverbs and most of what we're going to read tonight comes from a guy named King Solomon. Okay, we've heard a lot about King Solomon So I won't go into all the details, but I will say this, Solomon was extremely wealthy, okay? And so we are about to get working and wealth tips from a man that was very successful. It's estimated that his money back in the day would be more than what Bill Gates makes on an annual basis here. Estimated roughly over $300 million annually is how much King Solomon raked in, okay? I don't know about you, but that job sounds really nice right now, depending on how you handle money, okay? So we are learning some some wealth advice, some money advice, if you will, and how to work from a guy that had done it well. Not perfect, but had done it well. Okay, so get started. We're going to start in Ephesians 4.28, and we're going to let that balance us out into all the different Proverbs that we're going to go. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, you can look on the screen. But here's our key passage tonight that we're going to go from. Ephesians 4.28, it says this, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And what we see, there are three things. There are three ways that you can get money. One, you steal it. Two, you earn it. You work diligently through honest work. Or three, you give it away or you share it with someone in need. These are the three ways to acquire money. And this is where we're going to go tonight. We're going to break these down. And what you're going to realize is some of you didn't notice this, but you are moving into some of these areas without realizing it. And one of them is stealing. Might be a wake-up call for you. I hope it is. Now, there's a couple of things we learned in Scripture just to give a foundation for these. The first one, steal it. We know that's not good, right? Exodus 20, 15 tells us what? You shall not steal. It's real simple, real clear. No doubt there. It's pretty obvious. And then it talks about earning it, Exodus 29. It says, six days you shall labor and do all of your work. For six days. What do we do on the seventh? We don't know that concept, right? But we rest, right? We're going to talk about the Sabbath in a few weeks coming. Hang on, it's going to be good. And then the last one is give it away. Here's our foundation. We find it, Acts 20, 35. It says, in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus he, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Isn't that true? When you give something, isn't it just, it's just amazing to see their face light up, right? Little kid at Christmas. There's something about giving. We're wired that way, and it needs to be part of our life. Okay, so let's break these three down. First one, we're going to talk about stealing, okay? Proverbs 21.5, it says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. How many of you have ever been a part of a get-rich-quick scheme? All right, a couple honest people in the house. Very good, all right? Something like maybe uh, Amway. Busted. Something like maybe come sell the greatest vitamin in the world. Ever heard that one? Or maybe, um, what was it? Oh, oh, free money to pay your bills. Doesn't that sound great? Let me teach you something up front. Anything that sounds too good to be true is too good to be true, okay? Or you're stealing from somebody and you just don't know it, okay? That's right. And scripture is actually really clear. Those are modern day illustrations of get rich quick schemes, right? But the reality is scripture tells us the same thing. We read it earlier in our series in Proverbs 1.10. It talks about, hey, sinners, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And it reads on, such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessor. What it's saying is there is nothing that we can get, nothing good that we can get out of a get-rich-quick scheme. Why do we fall trapped to those? Because our culture, our people, us, always want to make money. And we want to make it the easiest and in the most way that we possibly can. We have put aside the thought that if I just work hard, I will earn the money that's due me. And we're all about what can I sell? 
what can I do, what can I create to make some money? And the reality is it's not everyone, but it's a good chunk of us. And then we get in that mindset and we start cutting corners. One day some of you are going to own a business and you're going to have that temptation to charge, to overcharge, or to undercharge, or to cut around corners, or to skim off the top. And you know where it's going to come from? It's going to come from this thought right here, that it's all about making money as quick and as easy as you possibly can. And Proverbs is clear. King Solomon begging to his sons, do not be enticed by the sinners. Do not fall into get-rich-quick schemes. And then we have the liars. Proverbs 21, 6, the getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. Be clear tonight. How many of you think, let's just do a little poll. How many think you'll own your own business one day? That, that's something you want to pursue, want to own some kind of business, okay? Those of you that don't have your hands up, you're very smart, okay? It is very difficult, okay? It's possible. You can do it well. It's very difficult. But let me tell you something. For those of you that will own your own business, the Lord absolutely demands doesn't ask, doesn't suggest. He demands that we as believers in Christ are honest in our business dealings. That we don't cut corners, that we don't overcharge, that we don't lie about the work that we said we did that we didn't or change an invoice to make it look like something we wanted it to. The Lord demands as believers in Christ that we are honest as businessmen and businesswomen. What happens though? Our tongues start to slip. Hey, we're a little low this month. Man, it would be great if we could just make a, a couple extra dollars this month to kind of meet our quota. And so we'll jack up an invoice a little bit. Or we'll say that this cost this much when really it only cost this much, but we just want to meet that. And the Lord says, hey, you be ready because those moments of temptation will come, but you are not to follow through. We are to be faithful and honest in all of our business dealings. For some of you now, working hourly jobs, that even includes clocking in. Oh, I'll just clock in, and then I'll take a little break, and then I'll hop out there. But it's cool, because I was here. I'm ready at any time to go to work, but I'm going to sit at the coffee table and hang out. You're deceiving your employer, and therefore you're stealing. Or I'm going to leave early, right? Just, just a few minutes. What's, what's three hours? That doesn't mean anything. Come on, they, don't, they won't know. Deceptive. You're deceiving your employer. You're lying, and you are stealing. How about expense reports? You work more in the corporate world, you're going to be turning into expense reports? I'll just throw this one, this dinner over here, that'll, that'll be fine. Well, I needed this for the office, but then I'll just use it at home too. So we get caught in this deception. It's not lying, it's not lying, it's just, you know, maneuvering around. No, it's deception. And it's stealing from the very employers that have entrusted us with their company. Would you want that person working for you? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And then the third way that we steal, we see it, Proverbs 6, 9. It says, how long will you lie there, sluggard? Get up from your sleep and go. The sluggard, the sloth. You don't like to talk about that this age group because, you know, sometimes that's us. Depends on the day. You know, this is mentioned 17 different times in the book of Proverbs. This is a big deal for King Solomon and those else that wrote. You know someone that's a bit of a sluggard? Lazy? Sleeps in? Don't look right or left. Just raise your hand. Sleep in late? They skip out on work? They're always wanting to hop in with you because you like to drive and they don't have to worry about gas. They always want to go to dinner with you because they know you'll always cover them because they feel bad because you're just so poor. <laughs> the sluggard. The thief. Taking from those that have. Right? The worst thieves of all are the ones that can work but won't. And you know what they're full of? Excuses. I can't work. My back hurts, man. I was lifting that pillow the other day, and I just, ah! <laughs> you know, that's not, that job, it's not spiritual enough. I want to be connected with the Lord. I can't, I can't do that. That's not going to work. They're not Christian enough. They don't act like Christians at that company. Guess what? You're going to see that everywhere you go. Get used to it. They don't treat me well. Full of excuses. They're nuisance too. They do finally come out to work and they're worthless. It's better if they would just sit on the couch because they just make it worse, right? Amen. You know someone. Don't look over there. Sorry, dude. It's all good. Just called you out in front of all. It's cool. 
They're nuisances. They're full of excuses. They always have something. But the truth is, you steal from those who work hard. All right, we see it with welfare. We see it with government programs. They're created for people that actually need help. That's, if a single family needs support, that's a good thing. I want to give my tax dollars and more to support that, but not someone that's just so lazy they won't get off their butt and do something. That doesn't excite me. That doesn't excite me. And you know what? We can look at that and go, I can't believe them, but the reality is some of y'all, let's be honest, you're going to sit on your butt all summer long and not do a thing. And can I tell you something? You would be completely, completely wrong. Was that clear enough? Oh, I'm a student. I'm in college. I can't work, man. I can't. You're also single. And when you're single, you have free time. There used to be a day. Where's my wife? I don't think she's here. Free reign. There used to be a day. There used to be a day. If she walks in, let me know. When I could wake up at 9 o'clock in the evening and say, Let's do this, man. The night just began. Let's go. Where are we going? We're going bowling, we're going putt putt, whatever. Let's go. I never played putt putt. I don't even say that. I don't like putt putt. Whatever. I'm trying to keep it G rated here. Let's go. There was a time when I could sleep in to like 8 30. That's sleeping in, by the way. Biblical, somewhere. There was a time when I could, man, you know what? Let's just go out of town this weekend. You want to go to the lake? Let's go. Where's the lake? Who cares? Let's just go. Drive. Let Siri drive. Let's go. Right? There was a time when I could do whatever I wanted, and then I got married. And it wasn't a restriction of life is over when you get married, because trust me, life just gets better when you get married, but the reality is it changes. I got to be there for my wife. I got to support her. I got to, I got to be able to help and, and do all this. And when she has kids, I got to be able to watch her because it's going to be exhausting watching her do all that work. I got to be there so I can be a part. That was a joke. I got to be a part, though. I got to support. And if I'm off on the other side of town or doing whatever with my buddies, I can't be there. And the reality is we got this side while I'm in college so I don't have to work. And maybe you don't financially, but let me tell you what's going to happen. If you don't work, here's what will happen. You'll be really bad with communication. Some of y'all need to listen right now. You're sitting at home not working, and that's probably why you're not very good at communicating with people because you've never had to practice. You're not good about being on time. Why? Because you don't have any practice with that. You're not good at at being a good friend. You're not good at helping those in need. You're not good at seeing situations and being able to navigate. How do I do this? How should I respond in this moment? Why? Because you're not out in the world working and experiencing that. It's not about making thousands of dollars. It's about experience. When we're out there and we're working and we're being diligent, the Lord uses that to train us and to mold us and to build us up. Working is a gift. And some of us will argue, well, well, man, God doesn't want us to work, right? It's all about saving people. And that's true. We should be saving people. But your greatest missionary opportunities will be in your workplace and in your schools. So if you're a college student, am I saying that you have to work so much you don't do well in school? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But I think you should do something. I really do. I really do. Even if it's a part-time job, get out there and get some experience in life. My time at Sonic... Man, I, I, got, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize what was happening, but the Lord taught me a lot. A lot about responsibility, a lot about management, a lot about working with people, a lot about Spanish. I learned how to speak Spanish. I mean, it was great. He used that to teach me a ton of stuff. And then I had other jobs, and you know what, man, I just learned and I learned and I learned. So I'm just saying, before we fight that, before we think about summer and say, man, let's just, let's just see what happens from the couch and the two, man, let's get out there. Let's be his hands and feet. Let's work because God's called us to do that. That was like all point two and three combined, but we're just going to roll with it. The second part is to earn. Proverbs 10, 4, it says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. We are to work hard, and you are to attempt to be the best you can be at your craft. The best that you possibly can be. Whatever it is that you do. You make snow cones, be the best at it. If you're a customer service person, be the best at it. If you're a painter, be the best at it. Whatever it is, Christ calls us to work and develop. Will you be the best? Maybe not. But we should strive that way to always be improving. We should master our craft. When you go to look for a mechanic, who do you look for? 
the best one, right? And an honest one at that. That's what we want. Why would we not want to produce the same thing when people are looking at us? Man, if you're out in the medical field, you better be the best, okay? Because when I come in, I don't want to know that you didn't go to school and you failed all those tests. I'm walking out. I want the best. I want someone that's mastered their craft and cared enough to took the time to work on it. And this is what he calls us to do. We work hard and we master our craft. Uh, diligent workers, they also plan their work and work their plan. We plan our work and work their plan. Some of y'all, your biggest problem right now is just you're just organized. And trust me, that was me too. When I came to this church and started working here full time, uh, I had all these great ideas, and they said, okay, well, well, show us your great ideas. And I go, cool, they're all up here. Let me, when you're ready, I'll tell you. And they're like, well, we, don't, we don't function that way. You put it on paper. You map it out. You think it through, and then you present it to us. And I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I just wrote them down and handed them like a, a, a notebook sheet of paper with handwriting. I learned quickly. That's not how it works. Guess what? It's the same way in the business world. It's the same way how we manage our time, right? Some of y'all, the reason you're not effective is because there's just so many things going on and you're not really sure, I'm gonna try to do that and then maybe I'll go there and do that and then maybe I'll go look for a job as I'm trying to, you know, and you're just all confused because we're just not organized. Diligent workers have a plan and then they work their plan. College students have a plan and then they work their plan. When I'm gonna study, when I'm gonna work, when I'm gonna relax, when I'm gonna be at church and when I'm gonna serve. But plan it out, all of a sudden it comes to life. It's amazing. Diligent work is also the hard working, and hard working is rewarded by more work. Hard work is rewarded by more work. Have you ever thought about that before? I'm going to work really hard so that more can come. Hmm. Responsibility. The more you show, the more I'll trust you with. And we see that all throughout Scripture. You look at Joseph. If you all remember Joseph's story, right? He, he was the favorite son. His dad loved him, and his brothers, Shipped him off into slavery because they didn't like him. He was faithful even as a slave. Some things went down, then he got thrown in jail. He was faithful as a, as a uh, prisoner, and as a prisoner, he was even moved up to the top, and eventually, long story short, he would rule over Egypt. Why? Because he was faithful. He was given a little, he was faithful, and it built him and built him, and he literally went from a slave to a king. That's what hard work does. It's rewarded with more work. I know for me, here at the church, uh, I've been doing college and, and young singles, this ministry, for a long time, and uh, the Lord just recently opened up a door and placed a, a whole nother ministry on my lap, and I got to be honest, at first I was like, Ugh, I can't handle this, this is too much, I don't even want to work with these people, they drive me crazy, they don't understand it, like this is driving me crazy, I don't want to do this, and then I was preparing for this, and literally it just slapped me in the face, that the Lord rewards hard work with more work. In essence, the Lord rewards responsibility with more responsibility. And I stepped back and I said, you know what, maybe this isn't exactly what I would have picked, but what an honor it is that the Lord would give me a little bit more. Diligent workers and your hard work is gonna be rewarded with more work. We should expect that, we should anticipate that and embrace that. And then the last part is, lastly, we should be generous. Diligent, hard workers are generous. Is it okay to be rich? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is absolutely okay to be rich. We should work as hard as we can and make as much as we can. But the catch is, it's what we do with all of that money that we have. You buy what you need. You provide for your family. You plan looking ahead. But then you take what's left and we give it away. We give it away. Some of y'all, you may not have a lot of money, but if you're not able to give a little bit, how will you be able to give more when God blesses you with that? It's a training process, just like working. I've only got a dollar, but I'm gonna give it because I know that someone could use this. I'm gonna buy your cup of coffee because I just, I see something inside of you. And then a couple years later, you know, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy a couple of Bibles for that Bible study over there because, man, I just wanna bless them. And the older you get, the more money you get over your years, you'll be able to do more and more. We're to be generous. There's a, um, a cool story I heard from um, Dave Ramsey. I don't know who Dave Ramsey is. Probably get to know him as you start to deal with money. He's, he's, got, he's not all perfect, but he's got some good philosophies. But he was telling this story about a, a coworker that he has. And, uh, and they, they give out bonuses every year to this, 
to their staff. And so this lady and her husband decided, hey, every year when I get, when we get as a couple, when we get our bonus, we're going to give it away. We don't need it. We don't want it. We just want to give it away. So every year they started what they called the Waffle House Ministry where they would take this bonus, it's usually three or four, maybe $500, and they would pull into the Waffle House to have breakfast. And they would just look, and as they walked in, they would say, Lord, put us with a waiter or a waitress that desperately needs this. And so they said, every time the Lord puts us at just the perfect, the perfect spot. And so at this particular time, they sat down. It was a single mom. She had two kids. She was working her tail off just to provide. And so they ate their dinner. And then they wrote on, their, on, the little, uh, on the little ticket, and they said, thank you for your hard work. We hope this helps. And they left a $500 tip at her table, and they walked off. And she was telling in this little letter, she goes, man, we walked out. We were just so giddy because we got to do something. We didn't need it. Could we have used it? Yes, but we got to give it away, and we got to watch someone's life be blessed. Let me tell you something, guys. Broke people can't do that. Do you get this? If we don't work hard and earn as much as we can, God won't be able to use us for those types of situations. You may never be able to give $500, but you may be able to give five to someone that desperately needs it when on the side of the road and need gas. But if we're not generous, if we don't think this way, if we don't wire ourselves this way, it'll never happen. And some of you right now, you have a couple of dollars that you could, and we're not going to take an offering, don't, that's not what this is about. <laughs> Clear that out now. But the reality is you could go home tonight and you could start thinking, Lord, I could take this money and I could go to Starbucks, I go to a couple other places, or I could take this and really give it to someone. Lord, show me what you want me to do. And I'll do it. And you will build a spirit of generosity. Diligent workers are generous. And then the last part of our text says we give it away. What causes poverty? There's a couple things. One is people that just choose not to work. The lazy people, the sluggards. Okay? You will become broke if that's you. Eventually it will happen. Okay, it doesn't have to be that way, but it will. The other group of that is the people that have all the talk, but they don't do anything. Yeah, I'm going to start a great business. We're going to change the world. When are you going to start? Well, soon. We're working for funds. I'm going to McDonald's, right? I mean, it's just not, it, we don't, they don't think sometimes. The sluggard, the sloth, you're going to have a hard time, and you're going to be broke. But the other are those that have just been impacted by events that are out of their control. And we know this happens, right? The death of a husband the, a tornado that wipes through your town and takes everything away. I mean, we could list them on and on and on, all the different ways. It's main, mainly based off injustice. Proverbs thirteen twenty three: a poor man fields, a, a poor man's field may produce abundant food, but injustice sweeps it away. So how do we help? Well, I think the first thing we need to remember, all of us, is that we are equal to every one of them. Right? There is no one in this world that you are better or worse than. God created all of us equal. We, had different, we may have different social statuses, but that's irrelevant because every one of us are human and every one of us are God's children. So we can't look down on them, and when we don't look down on them, guess what? It'll change the way we approach them. And the second part is we just give generously. And Proverbs nineteen seventeen says, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. We don't give to people to get in return. We give because God wired us that way. We give because they need it, and we give because God's given us the opportunity to do that. Uh, we've been working with our pastor uh, this past week uh, on probably some of the most exciting times we've ever had as a church family. Um, some of you may be aware, but we announced uh, two day, a couple of days ago that we're going to be launching two brand new campuses for Second Baptist. We're going to be going from five to seven. There will be full-size campuses like the campus that we're in right now. And uh, I mean, this is, this is like at the same time built, this is historic. This is, this is like never been done before kind of deal. And, uh, and I, I remember sitting at the, the town hall meeting we had and, and our pastor was just sharing the vision and, and talking about all this. And I started thinking and I just realized that, man, we are here. Like you're sitting in that chair because somebody before us cared enough about us to invest in this place. You get that? We didn't ask you for any money, and we won't before you leave. Someone came before and invested in this place so that we could be here. And I started thinking about that, and then I think about two brand new campuses, and I go, man, that's so exciting. But I also was just hit, and I said, I want to be that faithful. I'll never pay for a whole campus or even probably a chair, but I want to be a part of that. I want to be able to say that I cared 
about the Lord and his work enough that I gave. And that's not about giving to a specific church, but I'm just saying, man, it's exciting when we get to be a part of what God's doing. And God has equipped some of us more than others, but all of us to be able to give back to his kingdom and to be used to his glory. We are to work hard. You should work as hard as you possibly can. You should earn as much as you possibly can. And with the excess that you have very strategically, we should give it away to those that are in need. And I've used this illustration before, and I'll I'll leave you with this. Uh, The goal would be that your bank account when you die is empty, but your funeral is packed because you loved people more than money. And they came because you were generous, because you loved them. And your bank account was empty or maybe a few dollars because you gave to the people that needed it and you gave to the things of God. We're not gonna be perfect at this, okay? But the challenge tonight is simple. It's very practical. We need to work. If you're serving in a ministry, work hard. If you're going to school, work hard. If you have a job, whether it's six figures or six dollars, you work hard and you master your craft. If you still live at home and you get asked to do something, do it and do it well. Work hard because that's your work. Everything we do, every job that we'll have in any of those categories and more are to be done to the glory of God. You've been put here for a purpose and he wants to use you. That's the call tonight. And I pray, I pray that you will latch on to this. This summer, it's not about being lazy. It's about giving back and working and using yourself to your full potential.